So this is our sixth class, and um, you all have been here for most of them. Uh, I mean, you, many of you have been here for all of them, and uh, uh, it's lovely to have a class, even though it's punctuated by breaks, and we're about to take another break for a few weeks uh, here this summer uh, because I'm going to be out of town. I thought I was going to be out two weeks. It's actually three because I'm going to help move my mother-in-law on the third weekend. The next two weekends, I mean, the next two Tuesdays, I'll be in Newfoundland with Lisa, my sweetheart. And uh, then that third Tuesday from here, I'll be in Chicago moving my mother-in-law back. So she's moving back to our area, and we're thankful about that. Uh, if you want to pray for traveling mercies for us, and especially for Susan, as she comes to our community, she's going to be part of this community, God willing, unless she can't stand to be pastored by her son-in-law, <laughs> which might be awkward. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I've never pastored family members except for my own kids and my wife before, so anyway, all right, enough of uh, introduction and silliness. Um Let's talk about the homework and uh, the different songs of Isaiah in chapters 42, 49, 50, and then 52 and 53. Um, I just love your reaction, first off, uh, to the reading. What, what jumped out at you? What did you notice? Anybody? Go ahead. Because there were some that were, oh, this is really, really, really familiar. Some are familiar. Some of the readings was, right. were familiar and some, some well, not so familiar. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I didn't realize they were songs. They're songs. <laughs> yes, they're songs. Uh, how, do we, uh, how do we know what a song is? Let me ask you this question. How do you know when you see a song? In my mind, because it's indented differently. It's indented differently, okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so, like, if you if you go to um, Philippians uh, chapter uh, three, uh, some in some Bibles you'll see. Excuse me. Uh, yeah, uh, Philippians chapter two, uh, verse six. In some Bibles would be indented. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he's in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be grasped. Um, how, how do they know uh, that that's a song? Uh, how, how, do you, how do you know a song when you hear it rather than, uh, oh, any other piece of uh, literature? If you, were to, uh, if you were to hear it, obviously there's a melody but what's another part of song? It also has a meter to it. Yeah, there's a rhythm. There's a rhythm to it. Mm -hmm. Now, most of Hebrew in our Bible is poetry. Um, some of it is prose, but Hebrew poetry has this, this um, repetitive quality. Uh, it's called parallelism. And because it is uh, written so that the... The, the first line states something and the second line restates it. It's actually the only kind of poetry that I know of that can be translated into any language. God's pretty smart, isn't he? Since he wants it to be translated into every language, he's, he's quite smart. Uh, if, it was a, if it was poetry of rhyme, that wouldn't work because words... In, that rhyme in one language don't rhyme in another. If it's meter, it doesn't work either because words have different meter in different languages. So um, when it comes to songs, there's even more repetition. There's even more repetition. Um, if I said to you, country roads, take me home, to the place where I belong, West Virginia, Mountain Mama, take me home, country roads. What is that? John Denver. It's John Denver. And? 
Uh, and what is it? What, what part of the song is that? Does anybody know? Chorus. It's the chorus. And how do you know it's the chorus? Is it Because it's repeated. It has this, you know, there's some metrical things in there. Uh, but there's also a repetition of that whole section in the song. It's in there at least three times, uh, maybe four uh, in that song. Isaiah's uh, songs, 42 and 49 and 50, and then 52 through 53, they're called songs because there's more repetition. It's poetic, and yet it's, there's a, there's a stacking up of images having to do with a servant. And the servant, um, we're going to find out, of course, points to a person. And, that, and those are four different images uh, of the Messiah. Uh, what else did you notice? Are you recording? I am recording it. Yeah, is that okay? Or... Oh, you're just reminding me. You're just reminding me. Okay. Yeah, he was gonna. Yeah, he's not gonna. He's gonna hold back now. <laughs> no. Uh, any other things, uh, Shelley? You were gonna say something earlier. What? Did, what were you gonna say? No. Okay. Any other thing that people noticed from these uh, chapters? Okay. I think it, it, yeah, it's interesting. The, it's, it's very hope filled, but also very um, sad. Uh, but, you know, there's they're hope filled and sad. The world, but he's also going to be beaten and bruised and broken. Um, but that's where the it's just this juxtaposition of like right those concepts put together. So there's hope and there's pain, yeah. and it seems to me. How, how does that work? What, what, what does that remind us of, or what does it point us towards? Hope and pain. What? The whole book of Isaiah. The whole book of Isaiah, okay. What were you, somebody said something. Said that's life. That's, that's life, okay. But sometimes there's, there's hope without a lot of pain, and sometimes there's pain without a lot of hope. Okay? So, I mean, life can be on either side of that equation. Um. Hope and pain together. This is the story, we might say, of the cross. The most painful moment in the history of the world, where the weight of the world is avalanching down upon the Messiah, and yet it's the most hopeful, the most life-giving, the most hope-inducing image, truth, fact, historical event, in the world. More hope has come through that to the world than any other other thing. I want to tell you a story real quick, and then we're going to get into the text. There's a woman named Rebecca Manley Pipper, and she's a genius of evangelism and uh, sociability. And she wrote a really great book called Out of the Salt Shaker. It's on evangelism, and it's trying to help people, church people, get out of being all around church people and into the world to be salt and light. And she tells the story there of a woman that came to her for prayer. And this woman uh, came to her and uh, said, I, I'd, like to, I'd like to come back to church, but I don't think God would want me to come back to church. And Rebecca said, why wouldn't, why, why wouldn't God want you to come back to church? And she told a story that's familiar to many of us or people in our families or friends. She said, I had an abortion. I got pregnant. Uh, my fiance was a youth minister. I was a youth minister. We were working at a mega church. We were not yet married. I got pregnant and I panicked and I got an abortion. We got married um, and uh, it was just this incredibly sad thing. We're not in ministry anymore. And uh, I don't think Jesus would forgive me. 
And Rebecca Manley Pepper got quiet. She didn't know, know what to say right away, but she listened to the Lord. She listened to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit said this to, <laughs> to her. Uh, tell her that she's actually done something worse than that. Tell her that she's done something worse than that. And Rebecca Manley Pepper thought, well, I don't know if I want to tell her that she's done something worse. I mean, this is bad enough. And she's come to me broken enough. But she was led by the Holy Spirit. And she said, you have actually done something worse than that in your life. You have crucified Jesus. That's what you have done. And the woman, the woman thought about this for a while. And she said, you're right, it is worse. But if God could say, if Jesus could say, as he's being nailed to the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. If he could forgive me for that, well, then he could forgive me for this other thing, too. And she was freed by the cross that day. Praise God for that kind of, that's the message of the cross. It's the freedom of the cross. And we'll be talking about the servant of the cross tonight. So I want, to, uh, I want us to break up into four groups. I want us to break up into four groups. One will look at Isaiah's uh, first servant song. That's Isaiah 42. And then uh, the second group, Isaiah 49. Uh, the third one is from Isaiah 50. And then the last one, Isaiah 52 and 53. Um, and uh, I want us, I want you to talk amongst yourselves about uh, one of these uh, passages, and then um, and then we're going to come back together and discuss what we see. What is it uh, about uh, service that we see here? What do we see in the Messiah? So let's break up into groups, and uh, and then we'll get back together in ten minutes. And if you will. Uh, the reporter, if the reporter will come up here with me. I know that's daunting. But it's really not. All right, you didn't sign up for it, but come on, you can do it anyway. All right, Maggie, just speak. Okay. So Maggie's going to talk to us about, which was your passage, Maggie? It was the uh, fifth. 42. Isaiah 42, okay. Yes, yes, and we noticed that it seemed to be uh, addressing two different audiences, if you will. The first half seems to be addressing perhaps Cyrus as a Christ figure. Okay. And it's, it seems more like the other servant uh, songs. The second half seems to be um, a lament about the disobedience of Israel and Judah and the anger that he then turned on them. Okay, good. And uh, what did you notice about the Christ figure Cyrus there? Cyrus is a Persian king. He's not a, not a Jew, uh, much less uh, uh, Messiah himself. But what... Uh, what did you notice about his service or what, what he does? Cyrus is, um, I, think it's, I think it's in there, right, in Isaiah 42? Is it? Is his name in there? Behold. Behold my servant whom I, up, whom I uphold. I think somewhere in there it says it. Is he the king of Kedah? He's the king of, uh, yeah, the Medes and the Persians. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It does say here, um, that Kedar Kedar inhabits, villages that Kedar inhabits, yeah. and its inhabitants um, will sing a song of joy and well, shouts at the top of the mountains and uh, the glory of God. Okay. Maybe it's, um, 
Maybe it's from the previous chapter or something like that. I know Cyrus is mentioned in here somewhere. Yeah, he is definitely in here somewhere. Um, well, we'll have to get back to that. What, what was that? 45-1. 45-1. Okay. Maybe that's where it is. <laughs> but, okay. So, in, in, in 42, what do you notice about the servant? No, what, uh, and what, um, how is he like Christ? He's very gentle. He's gentle. And he will not fail or be discouraged. I found that actually rather encouraging. Yeah. Because the rest of it seems very discouraging. Okay. So he, he perseveres through difficult things. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, let's go to the, the next group. Okay. So tell us about uh, the servant in Isaiah. Is it 49? Yes. Okay. The first bit of 49. Um, it's kind of cool because the first few verses, it's actually the servant speaking. And he was chosen from the womb, and the Lord um, gave him all of these different qualities, gave him his help. Um, uh, da, 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 da. He was honored in the eyes of the Lord. And the, the really cool part here is that um, the servant says, no, I'm sorry. The Lord says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the remnant of Israel. Instead, I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation shall reach to the ends of the earth. And then the Lord, so saith the Lord, uh, just carries on in that same vein. Kings will arise and prostrate themselves because of the Lord. Uh, mountains will smooth out. Roads will be groovy. Um, just all these wonderful things. Nobody shall hunger or thirst. And all these people shall come from afar to take part in this kingdom. Okay. So it's not just, not just for Israel. No. It's for everybody. No, no. Yep. Okay. Uh, who is the Ted? You're gonna yeah. go ahead. Speak up. And stand up. Stand up. Yeah, like you're doing a recitation in <laughs> Great. third grade. <laughs> okay, um, so we are looking at chapter 50. Um, begins out by the Lord speaking, talking about the um, the sins of the people, and He's removed His presence and blessing from them because of that. Um, but he then says he's bringing it back through his servant. Um, the servant speaks and uh, talks of the, the Lord giving him a tongue to comfort people um, and teach them and uh, opening his ears. Um, and then also, uh, even though he is not rebellious, he is struck his beard is pulled from his face he spit on um but he sets his face like flint to go and allow himself to be put to shame um and that vindication comes in the light of the light of the lord comes through the servant to the world and those who try to make their own light fall at the end it says they will lie in torment okay thank you Who's your spokesperson for this? Alice? So we had more questions <laughs> okay. than anything else. Uh, but you, you had Isaiah 52 and 53? Yeah, okay. yeah. So first start part of Isaiah 52, um, you know, I, I got the pic picture of God saying, wait for this, you know, it's coming. And, and then he goes and he describes Isaiah in such familiar terms to us that we're like, how could... I mean, Jesus or... Oh, I'm sorry, Jesus, yes. Yeah, okay. He describes Jesus uh, with... Um, so clearly to us that this is Jesus that he's talking about. How could Jews who read this not say that this is Jesus? Like, so... And, and some of us said that they... John, I think, said it was a country. They think it's referring to a country rather than a person. That's their argument today. Mm -hmm. 
to refute Isaiah 53. Because we were wondering if we were even now in a synagogue having synagogue school, uh, how would they interpret this? If I was a, a good Jew right, right now today, right. and I'm reading this during my Bible study, right. what would they say about it? Mm -hmm. I mean, to us it's just so obvious. Right? This is it, this is it. But I guess it's not if you're... Yeah. And, you know, clearly he's always talking about eyes to see and ears to understand. So, you know, there are people who are not going to be willing to yeah. see and understand, right. and and this is for those who are. So, right. so that was one uh, one thing. Um, the other question was: Does it make a difference if this was pre or post um, exile? It because we weren't sure where this was taking place, and and I thought you know, on both sides, there's hope. You know, there's even after the exile, there was still oppression. There was still. Uh, issues. So, you know, so this still brings hope to uh, the people on both sides of that. Um, and then the last thing we, or one of the things we talked about as well was, why did it matter that it was a song? Uh, why does it matter <laughs> that it's a song? It's a great question. What, what did you come up with? Well, we, perhaps our songs easier to remember, you know, they, they don't read so that you can just chant and, and you know, tell the story and learn that way. I think songs are, that's great, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Songs are easier to remember, right? I remember <laughs> lyrics to, to, you know, crazy songs a lot better than I remember things that I read, right? Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's the meter, the uh, gets in your head, um, it's uh, the repetition. Uh, there's this. Uh, th there's yeah. Go ahead, Ted. So my wife Jody's a speech therapist, and she works with people who have dementia. And one of the ways that she can help them begin to verbalize things is remind them of songs that they knew. Uh huh. They can be completely nonverbal, but they can sing. But they songs can. From their youth. So that's even a different part of the brain. Yeah, and for absolutely. people who go through strokes, there's a different part that's accessed. And the more you repeat things, um, uh, sometimes something will go from one side of the brain to the other because it becomes like a song. You, you've repeated it so much. Yeah, go ahead, John. Uh, you may have covered this before Mary and I came along, but part of the issue here with Isaiah is how many Isaiahs are there? One, two, or three? Okay, yeah, that's a great question. John is asking the question, is, uh, are there... Are there three different books that have been put together? Are there two books or are there one book? I think for the purpose of this class and simplicity's sake, I'm just going to say definitively it's just one book. It's just one book. Now, written over a long period of time, written over a 70-year period or a 65-year period by one person. I believe it's by one person. Um, I know that there are some people who, uh, and, and Alice brought up this question, well, is this, is this before the exile or after the exile? Um, and we, it, it was actually in the first class, um, there is some modern controversy about the authorship because um, King Cyrus, who we're thankful that Dave found it, and we found him finally in chapter 45, not in 42, um, He's mentioned by name. How is it possible he could be mentioned by name? Some people say, well, he's mentioned by name because this is written after Cyrus was on the scene. Okay? And that is, uh, that is I would say, the naturalistic way to explain it, which, you know, there's no supernatural need there. But the supernaturalistic way to say it is God knew, God knows. Uh, he can do it, and so if he can make a 99-year-old woman conceive, he could do this. If he can make a virgin conceive, uh, we, we might remember, this is hard for us, but we might remember that God who's eternal actually exists outside of time uh, and touches every bit of every moment as if it were present eternally to him, which is a wild thought. Um, you, 
you could be in two different rooms at once as a as a human being. I mean, half of you could be in your kitchen and half of you in the dining room. And you would you could straddle that that divide fine, no problem. You could lay down three feet in one room, three feet in the other. Uh, uh, I don't mean that you have six feet, but you understand what I'm saying? At the four corners when you put. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so four different states. So take your uh, from the perspective of an ant, uh, you're in two places at once. Um, but from the perspective of you, you know, you're just. You know, you're on the dividing line. You can see both. You can see it all. Um, if you did a, a, if you did a, um, a recording, a video of somebody running through your backyard with a flashlight, say the backyard is totally, totally dark, and uh, the flashlight uh, is lighting up very brightly. <laughs> Uh, the um, the thing uh, you could play that back and uh, or you know see it and understand exactly what the person's going to do right or if you had a time lapse photography you could see that light as if it were compressed the time is compressed but the light is moving all the way through the field of vision you understand what I'm saying so if God is outside of time. He could do it. So that's my, that's my answer. Um, there are people who are faithful Christians. I'll say they're faithful Christians and they're welcome in, in the Anglican Church who believe, oh, no, this is probably a couple of different people writing this. Yeah. That's, that's okay. Uh, I, I don't, I don't uh, uh, think that they're bad believers or anything like that. But well, for I this, go with the one Isaiah, but the yeah. one reason is the big change from 39, chapter 39, into chapter 40. It's like a night and day change. Of, oh, that's a whole different style. That had to right. be a whole, another person writing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's an interesting question. I think, and, and John's point, just to repeat it for everybody, is that if you have a large change in style, a major change in style, it could be that it's a change in authorship. But it could also be it's a, a change uh, over the years, and then there's a, a re-engagement with a new, a new, a, a new time. voice, or it could be um, that really uh, the the sample size is actually too small to make that determination. Um, it's not as if uh, you know he had written one encyclopedia before half of an encyclopedia before and half of an encyclopedia after, we're talking about 39 chap chapters before and then 20, 27 chapters afterwards. And interestingly enough, those are the exact same numbers of books in the Old Testament and New Testament. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> 39 and 27? That's a little bit wild. Isn't that a little bit wild? And that there's this major change in between them. And yet, who's the author of the whole, the whole Bible? You'd say the Holy Spirit. And yet, he works through different personalities at different times. So, it's a mystery. We'll figure it out someday. But uh, I won't take a hard and fast thing. We're, we're pretty welcome. We welcome different sides of it. But I have my opinion. I think it's one book. One book that's written before exile, that's written over the lifespan of one uh, person. Okay, so we've all uh, checked in about our questions, and I want to go through. Um, I want to go through the servant songs uh, kind of one at a time, but especially I think Isaiah's uh, forty-two and then fifty-two and fifty-three. Yeah. Yeah. I think they could have and occasionally there's verses in here that we actually put to music and so that's the right. desires in here. Yeah. And I think the Psalms, I think people sometimes the whole Certainly song, the whole song the whole Psalter was sung. Okay. Uh the whole, all of the Psalter was sung. Some of uh other things were sung as well. Uh much of it's chanted uh, in order to to memorize if you go to the Wailing Wall today, you will see 
the Jews there and their Jewish men, the Jewish ladies aren't allowed to, in certain parts of the Wailing Wall. But so like right up against the Wailing Wall itself, you'll see these guys and they're doing this as they're reciting Torah. They are, they're, they're kind of putting it in their body physically uh, with this rhythm, they're rocking back and forth, up and down, as they're reciting to themselves. So, Isaiah 42, Behold my servant whom I, I uphold. 42.1. Isaiah 42.1. Behold my servant whom I uphold. And uh, just to be clear, it's it might refer to Cyrus who is uh, going to, and we see him, very clearly in Isaiah 45, or it might be Israel uh, later. But either way, if he's talking about Cyrus or talking about Israel, he is talking about the Messiah, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. My chosen, um, in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him, and he'll bring forth justice to the nations. So we look upon the Messiah. Uh, you th think about looking upon Jesus. Um, he is humble, uh, and the Father upholds him. What does Jesus say? He says, I can do nothing apart from my Father. I don't do anything that I don't see him doing. I don't say anything except for what I hear him saying. This is right out of, out of John, the Gospel of John. He's very clear. He's dependent upon the Father. And we might remember uh, the words of the Father. Thou art my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit descended upon him. Listen to this. This is my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. So we see the fulfillment there uh, of Isaiah 42.1 in the baptism of Jesus. He will bring forth justice to the nations. Uh, justice, the Jewish idea of justice um, is both an inward and outward. Um, inward and upward towards God. So there's a, a, a right relating to God. And there's also an outward human to human. And it's both. It's both uh, of these axes, uh, or horizontal and vertical. Um, and of course, we know that Jesus has done this, hasn't he? Um, he makes us right with God. Uh, he makes nations, people, right with him. And he uh, also uh, makes us right with each other. It says, he will not cry aloud or lift up his voice. He will not, there's a gentleness here. There's a gentleness here. Uh, and in verse 3, a bruised reed he will not break. A dimly burning wick he will not quench. Uh, we remember how Jesus describes himself. Do you know that the only time... He speaks of himself and what is in his heart. He says something. I think we might have mentioned it last week. He is what? Take my yoke upon you because I am what? Meek. Yeah, meek. Uh, that's one way to say it. Or gentle and lowly. That's the other way to say it. Um, he will not. Uh, so there is this fulfillment in personality and in gentleness and care that Jesus has, it's rather amazing. Um, is it correct to say that meekness is gentleness and strength? I've heard that before. That, uh... Yeah, I have, I have heard uh, lots of things about meekness. I've heard it's strength under control. I've heard it, I think perhaps the best way to characterize meekness, I would say, is that it is submission to the will of the Father. So Moses is meek. He's the meekest person in all of the Old Testament. Now, there are a couple moments when he's not as meek, 
he has his limits, right? When he kills the Egyptian first off, and he's doing that in his own strength. And then later on, when he gets upset with the Lord and with the people and strikes the rock, when he's told to lift up his staff over the rock. But Moses is really, he's amazingly patient. I mean, compared to... Com- compared to most of us, if we were parenting Israel through uh, all of the changes it had to go through and the stress, talk about a bad day, talk about having some tough days, Moses did pretty well. Uh, but Jesus, even better. Take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy. My burden in lo- is light. I'm gentle and lowly in heart. And you'll find rest from your labors. This a gentleness, this invitation. Um, a bruised reed he will not break. Uh, Jesus is so gentle. He says, let the little ones come to me. And what's a bruised reed? Tell me what a bruised reed is. Well, what's a reed? On. Something that's been stepped on, okay. <laughs> a stepped on reed. A reed that's just kind of falling over, perhaps. Uh, what does it mean, though? What's the significance? It's damaged, not as strong. It's damaged, it's not as strong. Yeah. And uh, Jesus is very gentle, isn't he, with the the damaged? When we think about some of the damaged people he <coughs> he reached out towards. Think about um, who who do we think of in scripture? Go ahead and, and just shout it out. A damaged or dispirited person. Can you think of anybody? Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene, okay, yeah. Who else? Huh? The woman with the discharge. Woman with the, the flow of blood. Had, had to, she had spent all of her money on doctors and she wasn't any better. 13 years she had been paying money to doctors. Imagine that. Uh, with a sick like Bartimaeus. Remember Bartimaeus who's, who's there on the side of the the gate in uh, Jericho. The adulterous woman. The adulterous woman. Uh, the woman uh, who had five husbands and the woman she was with who wasn't her husband. Um, Jesus says this. He says, uh, blessed are the poor in spirit. Mm-hmm. Blessed are the spiritually poor. A bruised reed. He will not break. A dimly burning wick. He will not quench. That's a beautiful, just a beautiful image. Um, and then, um, Maggie, you brought this up. You said he, he, he doesn't quit when it's difficult. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he's established justice on the earth. And we know that, that Jesus did not grow faint. He was not discouraged. He, uh, in a later uh, a song, it says he, he, he set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem. Well, he set his face like flint uh, in the Isaiah passage, but we see it very clearly in the Gospels. He's not going to be dissuaded uh, from the pain that is his cross to bear literally his cross to bear Um, he goes to the cross the coastlands it says uh, wait for his law in verse 4 he will not fail or discourage until uh, he's established justice on the earth and the coastlands wait for his law Uh, the the, the coastlands yeah I think the coastlands is the the Jewish way of saying all the lands that are really far away. Um, you know, they, they did not have a conception. Uh, they didn't have a conception of uh, the, the, the globe as we have it. Um, I'm not saying that they were flat earthers. I'm just saying that they didn't have access to the maps. Uh, they didn't have access to, to what we take for granted which is a view from space, a view from, uh, you know, from airplanes, 
uh, a view from all of this knowledge that's been compiled over the years. And so the coastlands, I think, uh, they mean America. They mean South America. They mean Australia. Uh, they mean uh, England and the heathen of England and the Irish, my people, who are even worse than the English. Um, oh, they did. They did. The Irish are the Irish are wonderful. I love them. They are my people, really. Uh, but um, all the coastlands were waiting, just waiting for Jesus, waiting for the establishment <coughs> where we no longer have to prove ourselves to God. In fact, we do you remember what Rebecca Manley Pepper had said to that woman? Oh, you've done something worse. What have you done? You have killed God. Mm-hmm. I have killed God. That is, that I think is the, the, the most honest way to read the story of the crucifixion. It's the, it's the Jews and it's the, he, and, and the Hebrews. But it was, it was humanity. It was the sin that put him there. Who, because of our sin, he was made to be sin who knew no sin. This was God's plan. Uh, my sin put in there, your sin put in there, we put in there. And uh, we were waiting for that message of grace. I, the Lord, in verse 6, have called you in righteousness. I've taken you by the hand and kept you. I've given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations. So, uh, it's not just for them, uh, just for the Jews. This is also echoed in the next uh, servant song, right? In, in 49. Uh, that it's too small a thing for you to be just for the Jewish people. It's too small a thing. We're going to have you, I'm going to have you be the uh, light for, our, for everyone. So, uh, that's uh, 42. Uh, the Lord does something for his servant. Uh, we might, uh, the, the, the father does this for the son. Up, he upholds, he chooses, he delights in, he clothes him in the spirit, he calls him in righteousness. And then he does something through the servant, the son. He brings forth justice to the nations. He takes him by the hand and keeps him. He gives him as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations. There are things that the servant will not do. He will not faint. He will not be discouraged. He, but he will establish justice on the earth to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon. Opening eyes that are blind, does that remind us of anything in the New Testament? Right? There's Bartimaeus. There are others bringing out prisoners from the dungeon. Think about Lazarus, come out. Or the widow's son at Nain. Or Jairus' daughter. They were in the dungeon of death. From the prison, those who sit in darkness. Okay, so that's Isaiah 42. And then I'd like just to... We're going to go to Isaiah 52 and 53. And uh, we do start off, it doesn't start off right away with the song, it seems like, um, but um, it, it, it happens, uh, the song kind of starts in the middle of 52, um, in verse 13, um, there's a call for Jerusalem in 52.2. Shake yourself from the dust, arise. And again, that reminds me of um, Jesus talking to Lazarus. Lazarus, come out. Shake yourself off from the dust. Also, it might remind us of what a, a good football coach would say to the young man who gets knocked down. <laughs> get up and uh, let's get back in the game. Arise, O captive Jerusalem. 
loose the bonds from your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. Um, for thus says the Lord, you were sold for nothing. You were sold for nothing. God didn't get anything out of the deal. And the people didn't get anything out of the deal. But they sold themselves into sin and slavery. You shall be redeemed without money. And we go down uh, through verse uh, 7 through 12. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good tidings, who publishes peace, who brings good tidings of good, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. If you ever want to hear this set to music, listen to Handel's Messiah. Uh, this is just amazingly uh, and beautifully set to music. Um, and then we get down to the fourth servant song in 14. Um, we, excuse me, 13, 52, 13. Behold, my servant shall prosper. Do we have a beep going on here? Some, oh. Is it? Okay. Thanks, Randy, for... Oh, it's mine. Is it? It's a new phone. Oh, okay. Well, Randy thought it was out there. I thought it was out there too. I did not know. Okay. Behold, my servant shall prosper. He shall be high and lifted up. High and lifted up. Um, do you all remember what Isaiah 6 says? Uh, we're back. Uh, I was in the temple and I, Isaiah, saw the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple so there's this this verb naash which says uh high and lift uh, lifted up and um this of course is repeated in john in a couple of places um in uh, john 12 in john 3 um we see jesus saying I will be high and lifted up, and I will draw all men to me. Uh, in John 3, it's uh, as Moses lifted up the servant, a serpent in the wilderness, so will the Son of Man be high and lifted up. And what was the serpent doing in the wilderness? It was a, it was a symbol that was made, and it, it was... It was like a game of tag with mortal consequences. You got bit by a serpent because you grumbled. You had to run to the serpent that was up on the pole, that was lifted up uh, as a curse. The serpent was cursed on the pole. It says in scripture, everything that's lifted up on a tree is cursed. It's a, it's a rather remarkable uh, set of images and uh, just the way God does this it's, it's really, it's beautiful um, so something hung out on a tree uh, you know, well it's kind of like our western stories if you're hung on a tree you're not doing very well, right? you're, you're swinging from a rope uh, same kind of thing um this idea of being high and lifted up. And then in verse 14, many were astonished at him. His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance. His appearance was so marred. And we might want to turn back to Psalm 22. Psalm 22, 7, which we know Jesus, uh, we know Jesus is uh, reciting this psalm. It's fairly been proved, I think, definitively, that when Jesus cites a psalm, uh, he, he knows the whole psalm. He knows it, and he's probably reciting the whole thing while he's there 
there on the cross. Well, it starts off in 22.1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer by night, but I find no rest. Uh, verse 6, I'm a worm and no man, discorned, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They wag their heads. Uh, and then there's this sense of being surrounded in verses 12 and 13. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and a roaring lion. I'm poured out like water and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. Uh, my strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaves to my jaws. Thou dost lay me in the dust of death. Yea, dogs are around me. A company of evildoers encircle me. They pierced my hands and feet. How did, how, how did this get in here? This is written 1,200 years before Jesus. This is 500 years before Isaiah. And Jesus, of course, he fulfills all of this. If you were to take a a beautiful globe of glass, a beautiful diamond, let's say, a big diamond. Remember the Arkan stone of Thorin in Bilbo uh, Baggins' story, The Hobbit. Mm -hmm. Under the mountain, the heart of the mountain, there was a jewel that Thorin, he just wanted so bad. It was called the Arkan stone. And it was like, it was like all of the light of all of the stars gleaming out of it. It was so beautiful and perfect. And when light hit it, light went everywhere. It just refracted everywhere. I have this picture of Jesus as the Arkenstone. But if you couldn't see the Arkenstone, and the Arkenstone were lighting up a room, and you can see this from time to time with cut glass, with crystal, right? Have you ever seen this? Where it just spreads out this beautiful, these beautiful um, bits of light, beams of light, uh, different colors. You, you know what I'm talking about? If, if you went into that room and you could not see the uh, cut glass at the beginning, uh, or you, if you didn't understand what had, was making that, that uh, light, the diffraction, the diffusion, the prism, prism of all of it, if you couldn't, you, you, you might reason your way back to a, a central thing that's being lit up. But then again, you might not, right? You might, you might just appreciate the beauty of the room being lit up. But to make sense of it all, you'd have to see the thing itself lit up. Are you all tracking with me? Do you understand? And I believe Jesus is this key to understanding all of this diffused light that's in Psalm 22. It's in Isaiah 42, 49, 50, 52, 53. In Isaiah 6, I saw the Lord high and lifted up in the temple. Or his name shall be called Emmanuel. Or he's the righteous branch. Or he's the shepherd. It just goes on and on and on. It's in every, he's the kinsman redeemer of the book of Ruth that's prefigured. He is the prophet like Moses who's spoken of in Deuteronomy. The Lord says, I'll raise up another prophet like you, Moses. Uh, he is the high priest, um, the high priest of all high priests, who's prefigured by the high priest in the book of Leviticus. We could go on and I could do this all day. I love to do this. I love this because he's so beautiful. He makes sense of so much. Yeah, Alice. I, you know, I... I think of Christ like that, and then it, it just, 
reading this this time, you know, it it occurred to me why focus on him being marred and scarred and deformed and oh, yeah. not attractive. You know, it's it seems incongruous. You know, because it's like he is that. Yes. He is that beauty, and yet physically his appearance is nothing to behold. Right. There's a it's a great question and a, a great comment. So in case you didn't hear it, why, if Jesus is that beautiful and he is that beautiful, why focus so much on the marring, the scarring, the, the way that he's falling apart, literally, in front of our eyes in Psalm 22 and Isaiah 52 and 53. Got any ideas? Just to foretell it. To foretell it. Okay, so there's a foretelling that could help us so that we would understand. That we would understand. So like when St. Paul was reasoning from the scriptures and proving that Jesus was the Christ, he actually went through this, and this foretells what he went through. And so it points to him as the Messiah. Okay, that's one, one part of it. Why else? We started off with this, didn't we? We said the cross was the the most violent and the most what? Hopeful. Hopeful and beautiful thing because of what it does. And so I think what it does is it shows us, the cross does, and these passages in Psalm 22 and then Isaiah 52 and 53, it shows us the price that sin costs that's one thing how much does my sin cost and I'm talking about a high handed sin I'm not talking about like when my son said the S word at age 3 and he didn't know what he was doing and I said to him Nico what does that mean and he said it means mommy can't find her keys (laughs) Um, and it was, the irony of it was I had probably said it in front of him a hundred times before that I, I, I'm telling on myself here uh, but it was the one time he heard it from his mother he got it this is, this is, a, bad, this is a bad moment I have to say this word but I mean there was a uh, uh, there's an innocence in that kind of sin but there's, there's a, a kind of sin that's high handed And the high-handedness of sin, do you know what the price of a high-handed sin in the Old Testament is? What's the, 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 the thing that you have to do for a sin that's unintentional as you do an atoning sacrifice. You go to the priest, you say, gosh, you know, I didn't, I didn't mean to kill so-and-so with my axe. The the axe head flew off the handle and it, it killed him. We were working, you know, we were chopping wood and he's dead and I didn't have any animus. There was no you know, but I'm sorry, or I, 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 I told something that wasn't true, but I didn't know it was untrue, or, uh, you know, any number of things. I ate something that I shouldn't have eaten. I didn't know it was in there. Those are unintentional sins. But what's the price for a high-handed sin? Well, stoning to death in the sense, eye for an eye. Well, okay, so that's the, that's the price of retribution, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But when somebody knowingly, and it's when somebody knowingly sins, and sins anyway, it was death. It was just death. That person shall be cut off from the people, it says. And that means off with his head, or stone him, or well, throw him out into the desert. See how he does out there. Okay, so the. Why show the difficulty? There's somebody who's being cut off for us because of our sin. Yes, Alice. So this is referring to at the cross? I mean, I just thought, you know, this was his general appearance, that the, like, there was nothing that people would be attracted to. Anymore. Okay, yeah, yeah. So you're, but I, it makes a little more sense now that this is the visualization of... I do believe it is okay. of the cross. Um, uh, when we're talking about he was marred. Mm-hmm. 
uh, he was, uh, let's, he was unstable. Unstable. yeah, he had no form or majesty nor beauty. Yeah. He was despised and rejected. Now, also, I, this is not a requirement for an Anglican or for a Christian at that matter, but the Shroud of Turin, I, I kind of believe that it's, that it's him. And actually the evidence looks like it's, it's a lot older than they had thought because uh, they tested a little patch of it. But they tested a patch. Why do you test a patch and then say that that's the age of the whole garment? A patch comes later. Anyway, if you look at the Shroud of Turin and you see the picture of Jesus, well, I don't think he's a, a super handsome guy. And maybe that's just part of God's grace. Uh, Jesus was so attractive to people in terms of his spirit. <laughs> he was extremely attractive in terms of his spirit. And maybe if the Shroud of Turin is really him, he's just a regular looking guy. He, he wasn't attracting people because he was super handsome. He wasn't some Adonis or... Uh, who? David. David was. David was attractive. Yeah, David was. Uh, Saul was. Saul, the first king. Absalom. Absalom was. Yeah, those guys didn't do as well. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Mary. Well, I believe since Jesus became sin for us, and God cannot look at sin, so He cannot look at Jesus dying on that cross. Hmm. That, you know, I think of that. I don't like the story. But the piece of wood and the snakes because I don't like that story. But I thought of yeah. the caduceus, a medical symbol of the the wood with the snakes and yeah. it, it's a symbol of healing. Yes, it like is. Jesus on the cross sure it is. is the healing of our soul. Right. Because All true. the sins were the ugliness. That's, that's right. why you couldn't look at him. Right, and that's why we say ugly as sin. Right? Because sin is the ugliest thing. Separation from God is the ugliest thing. He was despised. He was rejected. A man of sorrows. Uh, he was one from whom men hide. They, they turn their, their face away. Um, he was despised. Uh, we know this about Jesus. He was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows. Uh, we are in Isaiah 53, 3 by now. Uh, he was acquainted with grief. I mean, he is, he's ticking off all the boxes, isn't he? Um, as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. We esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs, in verse 4. He has carried our sorrows. Carried. He's literally carried our sorrows. Carried them as he carried the cross. He carried them to the Father. Uh, remember what? Oh my gosh, it's it's already eight o'clock. I'm just getting warmed up here. Um, oh, I have to stop. Uh, so he he carries like the high priest. He car who carried. On his chest, the names of the tribes of Israel. Did you know that was the ephod? And so Levi, Judah, Issachar, Naphtali, Gad, Dan, Asher, on and on. Uh, why? Because he was bearing them before the Lord, carrying these names, actually interceding. Jesus interceded for us with the Father. He prayed for us. He prayed for us aloud. Sometimes we have a record of the prayers because he told people or they overheard him. And sometimes he just spent his whole night in prayer. He just prayed to the Father, interceding for us. Well, we'll stop here in this picture of Jesus. We'll pick it up next time. Um, you all see from the notes, and uh, I'm just going to say it again. Our next class is not August 22nd.
because I've got to be in Chicago or coming back that night from Chicago after packing Susan up. So uh, we're going to do it August 29th. And then the last class will be September 5th, I believe, uh, the last uh, Tuesday. Now, I know that is the Tuesday before and after Labor Day. Tuesday before and after Labor Day. So, uh, uh, that's just the way, that's just the way it's got to be for me. So, thank you for your understanding, and, uh, let's pray, um, and, and, and next time, let's talk some more about that question, why the emphasis so much on the the difficulty and the cross. Lord God, we ask that you help us to understand the weight of sin and the beauty of your love. The the character of your mercy, the provision you make for us. Lord God, we ask that you open us up to the beauty of what you've done on the cross the freedom that we have, and the victory over evil, it is, both in us and in the world, the ransom that's been paid, and the union that we have with you as a result. We ask, Lord, that you keep our minds and hearts set on you. Help us to see your beauty. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.